I think we're live. Yes. Let's see. All right. Welcome to the weekend fly tying stream. Just gotta get some stuff on my way. All right. Welcome. Um. Yeah. So let's tie a fly. Let's hang out. Tie a fly. Um. Wasn't quite sure what I was going to do coming into the weekend, but uh, I think today we are going to tie a Helmsdale Doctor. This is a fly that I've never tied before. I don't know much about it, um, but I, I've kind of, since uh, since tying the uh, three men in a tub trio, the butcher, or butcher Baker, Candlestick Maker, all from Fran Francis Francis, uh, I've kind of decided that I want to try and do more of these um you know, series of flies. So, like, uh, I'd like to tie all of the different doctors or maybe all of the different versions of the butcher. Um, so, yeah. So, we're going to tie this one. I'm probably not going to do, like, all of the doctors all in a row. Um, a lot of them are very, very similar and have very similar uh, materials lists. Uh, so, that would get boring pretty quickly um but uh you know we'll do a few here and there and eventually i'll be able to show you an entire plate of doctors um we'll probably do the same with the different butchers and uh i'd also like to do um so there are a number of different variants on popums and uh also popum popum like flies uh let me just pull up my recipe list here. Uh, there's a uh, there's a fly called the Indian crow, and in some references, I believe that's what it's called. Um, that has very a popum like body with the veiled Indian crow veilings, uh, you know. And there are just a number of different similar styles of flies. Also, you know, there are lots of variations on the popum. Uh, I think. Um, one of the more interesting variants on the problem is the Francis Francis version, which, um, if you look in the book, the illustration doesn't match the description. Uh, the description has uh, describes a fly in which the Indian crow are tied um, only underneath the hook, like like a hackle, um, and the butts at the joints are uh, are peacock curl and not ostrich curl. Uh, but if you look at the plate. The plate is clearly illustrating uh, something more similar to, say, like a price tannin uh, popum, or um, I think popum from, oh, maybe Kelson? I don't know. Um, I'd have to look that one up. But uh, so it's, it's an interesting popum because it's totally different in the description. Uh, even though the illustration is closer to what we traditionally think of as a popum. And in fact, I actually have a version to show you. Um, So here, this is one of the frames. I don't know if I'll be able to show very well, but here's one of the frames that I show at um, various shows. And so this top one's a popum, and this is the popum from Francis Francis. And you can see the, the Indian crow are found on the bottom only. Um, so it's a very interesting popum. Um, Uh, and the other thing that I wanted to show you guys before getting started is uh, <laughs> uh, I was digging through my my traveling case, uh, just looking for materials for today's um, stream, and I came across this boat anchor. Uh, so <laughs> um, this was tied at a show maybe four or five years ago. Um, I had been very, very inspired as a young fly tire by the bead-bodied flies that Ron Lucas does. So I'd ordered a bunch of beads, and lo and behold, the beads were enormous. So uh, I contacted Ron and uh, for hooks, and he gladly provided me with, um, I believe this is a 10 knot Harrison Bartley hook with like an inch and an eighth extra uh, shank length, an extra heavy wire. Um, absolutely enormous. Uh, 
was fortunate to, enough to have found feathers that uh, at least fit on the hook. I will say um, these were not the best pairs of powder blue macaw uh, that I could have found, um, but they were all that I had at the time. Um, and, you know, it didn't turn out half bad, in my opinion. Um, but it is a little bit of a bug anchor. The, the wing pairs, like I said, don't match up quite, so the wings are a little bit wonky. They don't want to stay uh, aligned quite as well as I'd hoped. Um, <laughs> but, you know, funny thing is, I actually have two more of these hooks and two more beads um, that I may try to do. Uh, but unfortunately, like I said, they don't fit in my vise. Uh, so I have to tie these in hand, and that doesn't lend itself very well to my current streaming format. Um, but yeah, so there's that. Okay, uh, so Helmsdale Doctor. Um, we're tying today on a, I believe this is in the package says three aught price tenant hook from Gaelic Supreme. Um, I, I have found that this size hook, the three aught is approximately the same like size, at least in terms of shank length and gap gap width uh, as the one aught Harrison Bartley to Gaelic Supreme. So just keep that in mind. Uh, but it's a little bit finer wire. It's got a little long, longer taper. Um, the bend is a little bit, or the gap is just a little bit more closed. Uh, so it actually pre presents itself as a slightly smaller hook, um, ironically enough. So uh, I will put the recipe for the fly down in the description after the stream as normal. Um, But, uh, and, and during the stream, I'm going to have to be go, flipping back and forth to my uh, recipe list. Um, just so I can see, because like I said, I've never tied this fly, and, and I, I don't know too much about it. Um, other than it seems to be a fairly popular fly in the fly tying circles. Um, so, yeah. Uh, uh, the tag uh, is just flat silver tinsel. And I've got, uh, so I, f I found my fine, my vintage fine silver. I've got a ton of this stuff. I didn't realize I had this much. Um, this is a pretty stout spool. Um, but I'm just going to wind it down the shank and then back uh, I'm gonna need some extra light so I'm gonna be a little bit washed out here for a moment this is pretty fiddly fine tinsel This is vintage stuff. It's gonna have a little bit of blemish. Uh, I don't know if I can too much about that. It's got a nice taper. Too much off. 
I'm going to trim all of these um, butt ends short here uh, because it does have a a dubbed butt, a red wool or red. Uh, I'm going to use mohair dubbed butt in my trash can. Ugh. Right. I'm going to pick a topping for the tail. I'm going to use this one, but I think this one's got a little bit of a twist to it. Might still be a little bit long. Again, all I'm doing is trimming the excess fibers down to stubble. And then I'm using that stubble to make my tie-in point a little bit more secure. Just giving it a gentle flatten. And I want to flatten it, you know, I don't need to mash it down too much. Just want to flatten it just a little bit, just so it, it, it sits on the hook properly. But like I said, that stubble, like I've said before, that stubble was really just there to help bind down the tail secure it. And again, we'll trim this short because um, a little bit of the uh, butt ends will be covered. Right, so I'm going to take away a couple wraps, maintaining pressure. I'm going to wax my thread just right there at the tie-in point. As usual, has some tippet uh, uh, veiling the tail, so tippets. I was just looking for one with um, slightly narrower barring. So uh, if you look at the tippet, uh, they have a certain distance here. I think this one has slightly newer, narrower bars and slightly brighter, brighter orange um, on their smaller feathers. So and this is just tippet and strands, so it's not tied in as a whole. Feather. I just I need the narrow narrower bars for the uh, tail because it's just such a small piece. So I'm just gonna strip a few. Here.
So just a little bundle of uh, tippet. I'm going to try and line up um, the the bar. So this bar, the second bar of the tippet, with the end of the tag. Uh, for no particular reason other than I think it will line up nicely and just look neat. And I'm going to line that all the way down uh, to there. Just make sure it's centered on top of the tail. It veils it nicely. Trim, trim the buttons, excuse my fingers. All right. Next is a red wool butt, dubbed. But uh, we don't. I don't. I'm not going to use wool. Um, on one on this size fly, this is just a you know. It says three aught, but it, it's really a one aught. Um, so wool might be a little bit coarse for a hook this size. Uh, but we're going to use mohair, like usual. Um, just a little bit of scarlet mohair here. I like mohair for super fine applications, such as uh, you know, tails and heads on, on flies that are smaller than, oh, I don't know, I don't really have a size cut off. Just going to give it a little bit of a trim just to keep some of the longer fibers from trailing. Just neaten it up a little bit. That looks nice. All right, so the body has a fine silver, uh, oval silver tinsel rib, no hackle, no body hackle, that is. So we're just going to use, we're actually going to use, um, uh, this is Legarten and it's extra small, um, or sorry, it's extra, extra, extra strong. Oof. Um, yeah. I've done a little bit of a number on the uh, ends of these spools because I, I sometimes when I'm doing, uh, applications that require a lot of tinsel. I'll ch actually chuck these up in a bobbin. So, <laughs> um, yeah. done a little bit of a number there, but, uh, so I believe this is actually small. Um, we're just gonna bind that down there. Now there's no body hackle, so we're not going to worry about Figure out where to tie it in. Uh, the body is uh, just flat silver tinsel, um, large or large medium. I have medium uh, silver. Uh, now, one of the really important things about tinsel is because tinsel is kind of more of a rigid body material, uh, you want your underbody to be super even. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be like smooth. You just don't want there to be any lumps or bumps um, in it because uh, if, there are, if there are lumps or bumps, they will come through the tinsel because the tinsel, if it sits on a bump, because it's flat and rigid, sits on a bump, there'll be, you know, a clear uh, bump in the tinsel. So 
I'm going to be very careful about winding this forward. And again, in order to avoid bumps, we're going to tie the rib, the, the tag end of the rib, all the way to the front. And of course, we're going to be constantly flattening our thread as we go. And if we come across any, you know, places in the underbody where we might have made a extra bump or a valley or a divot, um, we can correct that with the tiny thread at this point. Uh, it doesn't matter so much. I will say, like, as long as everything about the underbody is smooth, it doesn't matter you know, what kind of taper there is, um, or if, you know, for example, in this case, as I'm winding my tying thread forward, the, the, the tag end of the uh, tinsel, the rib, is kind of migrating from the side to the bottom. That doesn't matter so much as long as it does it smoothly and without any bumps um, with uh, the tinsel, or with any underbody for that matter. You just want it to not, you know, bind in a certain place in a funny way. Uh, otherwise, that will definitely, definitely show through. Um, because this body and tinsel and, and, th and throat uh, are really simple, I'm actually going to take this all the way. The only thing I have to remember is that it's got a dubbed dubbed uh, a dubbed um, wool head um, but otherwise I don't need to leave too much space for anything else so suppose that's um, now, in order to avoid having a, a lump, because when you tie in something flat, such as tinsel, um, it's it's got to fold over in order to wrap smoothly. Uh, you'll you'll end up with a, a slight lump at the tie-in point. Uh, and in order to combat that, you want to trim your tinsel at an angle and you just tie in about halfway up that angle. So then when you fold it, uh, it'll fold and there'll be a little less bulk at the fold. Just bite it down, wraps forward, wrap forward to get the thread out of the way. Start wrapping. Do have a little bit of a lump where I did where I uh, tied off the, the underbody uh, thread, the, the unistretch. So there's going to be a little bit of a lump there, but I think that'll be hidden by the throat. going to wind down and back. Um, if I wanted to save a little bit of money, I could just wind, you know, tie it in at the, the tail end, the tinsel end at the tail end and wind, wind just down. Um, that works fine, but the reason why I like to wind down and back is that, um, you know, if, if, you're, if your wraps aren't perfect and some of the underbody is showing through. If you only have one layer of tinsel, it'll definitely show through. Um, if you do that down and back technique, uh, you're basically covering the any gaps that happen in the first layer with the second layer. And um, 
that just makes the body look smoother, more homogenous. It is a little bit of expensive to do tinsel bodies like this, but you know, if you're if you're tying a presentation fly or a display fly, uh, it's totally worth it, in my opinion, because um, they definitely look better. All the way, tying tying in point. And tie it off underneath. Um, when you're tying off tinsel that's this broad, um, what I like to do is I just like to uh, tie off, tie it off, and then cut it at a bias, and that gives me a little bit more surface area to um, tie it off while not adding too much more bulk. I'm going to tie that down thoroughly again because it's such a heavy tinsel. Um, and as you can see, here, I'll turn off the light now that I don't need it. As you can see, um, this is a perfectly smooth and even tinsel body. Um, yeah, if you if you go on my Etsy and you wonder why certain flies are, are more expensive than others, um, it has to do with both the feathers that are on it, the hook that it's tied on, uh, and also whether or not I used a large amount of tinsel. <laughs> um, because tinsels um, are expensive, especially metal tinsels these days. Uh, I suppose you could find some of the, like the uni, the uni tinsels um, are okay. Um, I think they're like six or eight dollars a school um, but like the vintage tinsels or like the French tinsels, they can go for $12, $15 a spool. So, um, yeah. So that's, that's just something to keep in mind. But anyway, we have a nice smooth and even tinsel body. Um, I'm just going to wrap. And we're actually going to wrap a fairly large number of ribs of, of uh, turns of rib because there is no hackle and so just in order to give the body some visual appeal we'll wrap a few extra normally i do five on a classic fly like this i'm going to do seven if i counted right that was seven right there one two three four six seven. yeah uh, i think if i remember correctly it only looks like six from your side, um, but it is seven from my side. So. Just going to turn it down. Right. So there we go. So yeah, this is a pretty simple fly. Um, nothing, nothing out of the ordinary. Uh, I think the one thing that it does have that is uh, less common in some of the popular flies is a is an underwing using peacock curl. Uh, you know, if you look if you look at the common flies like Jacques Scotts, the Doctors, Green Highlander, Jacques Scott has um, peacock curl excuse me, peacock sword fibers, but they end up going over the wing, um, uh, not as an underwing. Uh, so underwing, peacock curl underwings are a little bit more rare. Um, Helmsdale Doctor is one of the few that I can think of off the top of my head. I'm sure there are a couple of others. Uh, but yeah. Uh, but first, the throat. The throat is a gold or a yellow or golden yellow uh, hackle. Um, because, again, because it's a throat and not a body hackle, we want to pick something that has, or we don't need to pick something that has a whole lot of taper. Um, 
and we're gonna pick something that maybe is a little bit longer than we would normally pick because again, no body hackle, so there's nothing giving us bulk under the fly to balance the wing. So uh, just slightly longer, bushier hackle may be in order. Few wraps here into wax more thread. Uh, so you'll you'll see me unwrap wraps of thread every now and then, and it's usually because I habitually kind of over over wrap things, um, and I'll probably take seven or eight turns of thread when I only need three. So I've kind of made built it into a habit that I usually unwrap. Uh, a couple of turns. Um, it's just good thread management uh, practices, uh, especially if you're trying to achieve a small head. Uh, I, I've said it in the past, I don't really care about a small head, but um, it is just good kind of a thread management uh, practice. Uh, you do have to be careful because sometimes you'll unwrap too far, and that's not good. But um, it also uh, helps when you are, say, waxing your thread to unwrap a few turns because when you wax your thread, you usually can't get the wax right up against the, the hook and uh, you'll end up with a piece of bare thread. If you, if you unwrap a couple of turns and then uh, wrap them back, you'll have wax uh, right from like a tie-in point. Um, that can be particularly helpful if you're tying in something small, like a hurl for a head um, or a hackle. So. But, you know, there are certain areas where you don't want to build up bulk if you can help it. Under a hackle is one of them uh, because the hackle will add its own bulk because of the its stem. Uh, and then, like, you know, if you have a tail, if, if you have a tail section that doesn't have a butt, uh, then you want to try to avoid building up bulk there. So again, I'm just folding the hackle as I go, just generally sweeping the, the hackle fibers back so um, they don't get caught under the stem going forward. I'm gonna wrap a fairly robust hackle. I'm just keeping an eye on making sure that every turn of hackle is immediately in front of the previous turn. I'm going to take three or four because, again, I want a fairly full throat. This is the only only bulk or the only kind of feather bulk that I'm adding that will balance the wing under the hook. And I've left plenty of room at the at the at the eye, so I don't need to. So I don't need to worry about crowding the eye. Still have plenty of space for my dub head. Two turns. Um, learning to manipulate. So you'll you'll notice that I've made, made those turns with my uh, left hand. Uh, learning to manipulate your bobbin with either hand uh, can be really really useful. Um, particularly learn particularly when you're tying in things at the front of the fly. Because uh, you want, sometimes uh, it's easy, just easier to hold material up to the fly uh, using your right hand uh, or securing it with your right hand. So yeah, um, I'm not going to fully brush the hackle under the hook. Um, I just never do that, but I'm gonna pull a few of the fibers below uh, just to add just a little bit more uh, density to the underside of the hook. Okay, and as usual, we're gonna have to build up a little bit of thread bulk right here at the hackle tie-in point because 
Michael um, is going to interfere with the wing mounting. Okay, cool. So normally here, I would switch to black thread. Um, if I were doing a, a, a fly with a black head, or you know, black curl head or a black lacquered head, I'd switch to black, um, black thread. Uh, but this has a red dubbed head, and I have found uh, when using this very fine um, mohair that black thread can show through the dubbing. Um, so I'm going to stick with white thread. I'm just going to pull up a little bit more. Um, so I'm going to stick with uh, white thread. I'm going to have these. Uh, I have this very nice peacock eye. And pick a few. Uh, so I'm going to try and pick uh, hurls, or I'm going to take a um, three or three to five hurls from this section here, maybe you know, a couple from each side, um, mostly because these are fine, fairly fine um, hurls, uh, but they're also of a fairly good color. Because some of these, you know, um, you get further down in the eye, stock and these turned more of a bronze and I think I want a more green uh, hurl and so these have green tips and so I think I'm going to use some of those and I think I'm going to use like three from one side two from the other I don't want too many of these uh, I just need enough for a bundle and I and by taking some from each side I, I, I balance the or you kind of sort of help balance the forces because again these have a bit of a curvature um, by balancing the forces you kind of come up with kind of a, a a bundle by consensus so you get like a, a slightly more compact bundle and also because the stems of the curls are flat, when you tie them in, uh, you know, they'll tend to, they'll try to go separate ways. Kind of don't want that. Soft loop. I'm going to pause and see how that turned out. A little bit of a pull just to line up the thread. So, if you're having trouble with, as you tie something in, if you're having trouble with the thread slipping towards the eye, you can always just give the, the wing material or wing component a gentle pull to the rear, and that'll just bring the thread back into alignment with you know the tie-in point that you desire. So with that, I'm going to unwrap one thread. Turn it up, I'm going to wax thread. So I'm going to trim these right away so they don't get in the way of mounting the wing. Um, like I said, I've never tied a Peacock curl underwing. Uh, these seem pretty pliable. I'm pretty impressed. Uh, I think part of that is just choosing finer uh, peacock curls. Um, for the uh, for the underwing. Bind this down, bind back to the front. Now we're ready for the wing. Okay. Let me quickly just put a few things away so that I can get them off the desk. Uh, 
and I save. So these uh, these tail ends of tinsel, all of these, I'm going to save for future work, and I just I just toss them into a an Altoid tin um, so that they don't get lost. Pretty used to finding bits of tinsel everywhere, but, uh, and bits of feathers too. Okay, so uh, that's the underwing. Um, yeah, normally I would stop here and say, hey, we'll do the wing next week. But uh, this is a simple enough fly, I think, uh, that we should be able to build a wing and mount it today. Uh, also, I don't mind making these a little bit of a longer stream. Um, I know, you know, people right now are, are looking for entertainment, and uh, I'm happy to provide. So this is a fairly material heavy wing. Uh, it's got blue, red, yellow, and orange swan. Um, I, of course, I'm going to use turkey. Uh, it calls for white swan, cinnamon turkey, mottled gray turkey, and bustard, which of course means speckled bustard. Uh, plus a topping, so it is a fairly long material list, rel well, relatively speaking. Um, it's not that long because it doesn't have things like florican or, uh, you know, golden pheasant tail. Um, but it is still, it's a lot of, a lot of turkey. <laughs> <clears throat> so, let me see. I think we're going to do... So we're going to do two bars of each. Then I'll give us 16 bars. And then we're going to do four bars of Bustard, which will give us 18 bars. Um, for a one-out hook, that will be plenty thick. Now, just to decide what order we want all of these to go in. Now, I like the idea of interspersing the non-colored. So, like, the cinnamon turkey and the um, mottled gray turkey and the, the white swan in with everything else as kind of like a, like a, a way to... Um, break up all the colors. Uh, I think because some of the color, or some of the choices like white and model gray are fairly pale, um, the mixture that I'm going to do is going to leave those like in full, um, full segments. And because I'm only doing two bars of each color, I think I'm going to leave those in full. So, um, we might just end up with a full bar of Bustard at the top. Well, let's see. <clears throat> so I'm going to go from light to dark uh, with, the colored, uh, with the colors. I'm going to go light to dark, so yellow, orange, red, blue. Um, even though the blue is technically lighter than the red that I have, um, it will read darker. But then I'm with the kind of the neutral tone uh, turkey, I'm going to go dark to light so that, you know, the white and the gray stand out a little bit more uh, between the darker colors. So, um, and you can't see it, but I've laid out my materials here in front of me in the order that I'm going to build them uh, just so I can get an idea. And I actually kind of like that idea um, a lot. So, yeah, this is how we're going to do it. Two bars of yellow. It's not, this particular feather is not the nicest yellow, so I think we'll keep on. I've got three of them to pick through, so that's a nice, nice yellow. Just 
just two bars. This is a one-out hook. If I were tying a larger hook, I probably would go, go to three or up to three. But no need to overload the hook. Um, I think there are some people who would be very comfortable with putting 24 bars or 24 bar wing on a one-out hook. And while I think technically quite a few people could achieve that, um, man, overloading your hook is just, it doesn't look nice uh, in my opinion. A lot of people tie their salmon flies kind of top heavy in my opinion. And, uh, you know, it's a style for sure. People people um, like large wings, uh, but, you know, my opinion is that if you're going to tie a large wing, tie it on a large hook. Uh, you know, people, people obviously disagree with that statement, but, yeah. What can I say? So to marry these slim strips, all I'm doing is just placing them next to each other and then gently pushing them close enough so that the barbs will mesh. So there's the yellow, yellow, cinnamon turkey, and orange. And my lights are starting to freak out. I need model gray. And this is a you know, model turkey tail, but I'm going to take from this grayer portion here. Um, it might even contain a little bit of the black, the charcoal from the, the black tip, but that's okay. So I'm going to have to turn this light off because it's a little bit in my face. Um, yeah, I bought this uh, kind of inexpensive uh, like LED desk light. It, it's it's great. It has some great function, um, but I have noticed that it has started to like flicker after a certain amount of time on, which I suppose you get what you pay for. Unfortunately, I'm definitely well out of the warranty period, so. There's that. Now I'm just adjusting the shape as I go, and the way I can do that is by changing the angle. So if you think of this as being like a slip from a single feather, um, if you want to change the angle, you just kind of bend it down a little bit and then stroke it out so the, the barbs re-align. Um, if you want to make the angle a little bit steeper, you just kind of bend it up. Um, this tip shape is turning out pretty well. Next is red. Some beautiful, beautiful red turkey here. So the red's pretty dark, but that's okay. And we have some beautiful Holland white. Well, this isn't Holland white. This is like a pale palm. 
really, because it's got the black tip. I think true Holland white doesn't have a have, have a, a bar on its tail. Um, this is some very beautiful. So I'm actually going to take it from the other side of the feather because the curvature. So I took a slip from this side here, but the curvature is wrong. It's actually re, this, this side is recurved, which is annoying um, because it renders this side more difficult to use. Um, so as long as I've got a full intact side with the correct curvature, I am actually going to take from that side. Since I've already cut into this, I'm not going to worry about it too much about. But as you can see, white is a fairly uncommon color. cut into my white very often. <laughs> okay. So the white fiber is the shortest of them all by, by a fair margin, but it's still plenty long enough for the fly. So the blue. So there we go. The tip of the blue is just a little bit long, so pull it apart and remarry it. Just realized we have red, white, and blue at the top. So this fly is either going to be slightly American or slightly French. Then we're going to do four bars of mustard. Of course, we have this beautiful quarry mustard. slab right on top and then decide whether we want to mix it in a little bit more or not. I am generally of the opinion that I think a fly looks good if it has some kind of dark barred thing on top, but we shall see. So this is what the, the finished wing looks like. I think it'll look pretty good. Now, one thing I will note is the wing on this is fairly simple. So it's just got the peacock underwing and the wing, the main wing. So there's no topping, there are no sides. Uh, so I think having that fairly broad strip of buster on the top um, is all right. I think that looks, looks appropriate. So, all right, so to build the other side, now all I did there was um, because the white segment is the shortest, I just trimmed the end, the butt end of the wing 
so that they're a little bit closer in length. Uh, that just makes it easier and it, it, it makes it so that the butt ends, when you're tying the wing in, the butt ends won't get crossed up and mixed in uh, between the right and left wing. Uh, this kind of makes things a little bit easier in that regard. So you can take two segments of each from the other side of the feather now. following Two yellow, two cinnamon. Go to gray barred or gray modeled, two bars of gray modeled turkey. So I'm just gonna select where in the feather I want it from. I'm gonna pull the feather apart at that place. Yeah, so this feather likely had pretty nice white tips, but uh, in the process of being a turkey, the turkey managed to essentially chew them off. Although I'm sure they weren't chewed off by the turkey. Might have been pecked off by the, you know, the turkeys in the pen or just ground off on the ground. But so it's gray. So I'd be very interested to hear what all of you, what you've all been doing with your time at home, fly tying wise. What are the patterns you've been working on? What techniques have you been using? What techniques have you been working on improving? So uh, feel free to comment below. And uh, yeah, just curious to see, uh, see how, how people have been doing. So. White, just blue, and well, you know, I'm using two bars. Look at that. That was exactly two. So 
talk about fortuitousness. Oh, it's blue. Okay. Next. Bustard. One, two, three, four. The angle of the, the angle on the tips of this are just a little bit up the clusters a little bit sharp. So I'm just going to change the angle a little bit just by gently manipulating the barbs. I'm just going to tie it, marry that in. So there we go. That's the far wing. Again, I'm going to trim the butt ends just so they're all probably closer in length. This makes it easier. I'm tying the wing end. So there we have our. Oop, try not to drop them. We have our two wings, mirror images of each other, uh, looking pretty good. Going to just move around some feathers because I need a little space. And let's tie these in. Now, there is a technique that I have seen in like Fly Tire Magazine where you trim the ends of the wings flush and then you run a bead of glue down them and that helps keep them you know all together uh, when you're tying them in uh and i think that's an interesting technique i don't think it's necessary but i'm just going to run a little bit of a bead of saliva could use water if you're squeamish about using your own saliva. I'm just going to run a bead right at the tying point. That helps soften up the feather, prepares it for uh, compression. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to pinch it here. I'm going to pinch the butt ends. And I'm just going to lift the butt ends, which helps start compressing the wing right at the tie-in point. So um, you can't see it, but I'm just compressing the wing. Just starting that compression going. And you want to grip it here really tight because that's what helps keep the wing stacked up um, properly and so that it doesn't fold oddly. So I'm just going to soft loop let the weight of the bobbin pull the wing down and compress it constantly constantly compressing with my fingers and then just in the loop more compression and there we go eh. folded a little bit wonky on the the far side but that's kind of to be expected. Take a couple more turns with increasing pressure. And I'm just going to shape the wing a little bit. <clears throat> and there we go. So now to trim it, I'm going to grip it right at the tie-in point. 
and I'm going to gently trim in small segments the butt ends of the wing. Okay, now I'm just going to refine that a little bit uh, by trimming it in a taper. Excuse my fingers again. Again, I'm, I'm pinching it right here at the wing tie-in point really tightly so that the wing doesn't shift while I trim butt ends. Because that'd be... Because most scissors, when you cut, they actually, they cut, you know, they, in, in they have a, a certain amount of shearing force and they can cause... And that, and that force can introduce a bit of rotation into the wing. So we want to be careful. not to let that happen. Then I'm just going to take our thread, I'm going to wax it as, as usual, always with wax thread, flying down the butt ends of the wing. Uh, this just gets a topping and a dubbed red head and that's it. So this is a, you know, simple fly. I really probably need to replace this. <laughs> I say this every week and I don't do it, but I probably do need to replace this spool of thread because like I've said before, this particular spool has become fairly frayed at this point, uh, just on the spool, not even, not even in tying. But, we're going to rescue this, just like we do every time the thread snaps. Okay. I'm not panicking, or trying not to panic. Soft looping the hell out of it and waxing the thread. Alright, so I'm just going to, if you wobble the th if you grip the, the tying point of the wing and you wobble back and forth, you can move the wing to the top of the hook, which is a good, well aligned. I'm just going to bind it down a little bit more here. quite centered on the, the hook, but that is probably about as good as it's going to get um, with a snapped bit of thread. So uh, I would like the wing to sit a little bit higher on the hook. I don't think that is going to be in the cards today. All right. So that. Don't need an overly long crest for the over crest. See how it sits. 
afraid this crust might have a little bit of a twist in it. It's not going to be tied in properly. It doesn't look twisted. Also, it's still a little bit long, so I think we're going to pull past the twist. So unlike the tail, we're just tying it. We're going to strip the, the, the extra barbs down to where we want to tie it in. And then we'll flatten it. Um, we can correct a little bit of twist by flattening it. Uh, give a little bit of a kink so that it rides up and over the wing. You might have to do this a couple of times because you want your crest to be at the proper length. which most people hold as just meeting the tail right at the tip or meeting the tip of the wing, depending on how you like it. That is pretty close. Um, just point down a little bit to see. Yeah, there's a twist. There's a twist to it. No good. No good. Um, I will say that this is one of my straightened crests. Uh, well, there we go. This is one of my straightened crests, and um, I've said I think I've said this before, but my preference is to not use straightened crests if I can help it, um, because straightening a crest isn't permanent. Um, if there is, you know, a time of higher humidity or, uh, you know, the crest gets wet for any reason, it will revert to, uh, back to whatever natural state it started in, um, whether you straightened it or not. Uh, but... That is about as good as it's going to get. <laughs> so, there we go. Uh, but yeah, straighten crests. Um, will revert to whatever state they were on on the bird. Uh, or however they grew, you know, out of the bird. Um, if there's a little bit of humidity uh, or if they get wet, like I said. Um, so, you know, straightened crests are great. They look good, but, you know, they're hard to keep straight. Um, you can do a few things once they're on the, you know, if they're on the fly, <clears throat> such as, you know, pairing them up with a, a crest that's, maybe has a twist in the opposite direction. Uh, when you mount them in a frame, you can, you know, make it so the frame pushes the crest towards center. Uh, but in general, you know, straightened crests will only stay straight if, uh, if you can keep them out of the humidity or like away from, I guess, water. I don't know why these flies would be getting wet anyway, but, you know. So a little too much dubbing on here, so I'm just going to trim a little off. The, the thing about mohair is that mohair has exceptionally long fibers um, compared to some other dubbings. So you might actually need to trim them. So again, I'm going to wax my thread before finishing this off. Wax my thread because it helps stick down the fuzzies. Whip finish.
Hey, and there we go. Hey, that's a complete fly. Homestyle Doctor. I like this. I like this pattern. I like this version of a doctor. Um, it's pretty simple, though. Uh, maybe uh, maybe if I were to do, you know, a variant, um, I might add a uh, you know some sides. Maybe some teal sides would look good. Um, mallard roof wouldn't be too bad. Uh, and certainly having a mallard roof would give you some additional um, leeway with, uh, you know, how you utilize dark color in the wing. So here, you know, because there wasn't a uh, all the roof, I opted to keep the the busted all in one large chunk. And I feel like if there had been a mallard roof, I might be uh, more tempted to mix the the busted into the wing. But. Didn't, so I didn't. Um, there you go. There's the completed Homestill Doctor. Very nice, very sleek pattern. Um, like I said, I've never tied it before, so this was a, kind of nice to tie it. Uh, 10 out of 10, this would be a great introduction to like tinsel bodies. If you're, if you're looking for a way like a simple fly um, to tie uh, as a beginner, uh, and you want to practice your tinsel body, this would be a great fly to tie to practice winding tinsel because the whole body is tinsel and there's no rib to worry about, or sorry, there's no hackle to worry about. You get a nice rib. Um, the wing is simple enough that if you're uncomfortable with winging flies, you can, um, practice your tinsel body without having an overly complicated wing. Um, and it's attractive, uh, certainly is attractive. So, uh, yeah, I would definitely consider this, uh, you know, potentially a, a good beginner's fly, uh, for practicing, uh, tinsel bodies. Um, so yeah, there's not much more to say about it. Simple fly, straightforward, uh, Really nice. Uh, I like the wing, the way the wing turned out uh, in, in this version. And uh, yeah. So uh, if you'd like to see other doctors, uh, black doctors, silver doctors, blue doctors, even a dark blue doctor variant, um, you can check out my Instagram at justwondering.brad. Uh, I am going to be running a giveaway on my Instagram once I hit 500 followers. Uh, kind of stalled out for the last couple of weeks, around 450. Uh, so if you want to share my Instagram with your friends, uh, let them know about the, uh, the giveaway. Uh, I'll be giving away, I think right now I've got maybe 10 or a dozen uh, fishing flies uh, that I've tied. They're mostly Mary Orvis Marbury flies. There are some mixed wing wets and some simpler salmon flies. Uh, so um, there's those. Uh, so yeah, so when I hit 500 followers, I'll be doing a giveaway. And then um, if you would like to support, wow, all the sirens. Sorry, I have my window open because it gets stuff in here. Um, but uh, if you want to support the stream uh, by purchasing a fly, or if you want to purchase a fly you've seen me tie, uh, you can head on over to my Etsy shop, Studio1213. Um, all of the money that I earn through the Etsy shop goes back towards improving the stream. Uh, I'm very fortunate that I don't have to rely on the income from my fly tying. Uh, so I'm able to take all of that money, turn it back around, put it into the stream. I can buy more materials, I can buy more hooks. Um, right now I'm 
doing a push to uh, purchase a an upgraded computer so that it can start doing video editing. Um, I'd really like to do some kind of close up how to videos. Uh, but right now I'm running a, kind of a stock laptop and that's not very good for video editing. Um, especially if I want to do like more kind of close in high definition uh, videography. Um, so yeah, that's my current uh, financial push over on the studio uh, or the Etsy shop. Um, but yeah, thanks for hanging out. Um, I hope everybody is staying safe and healthy, uh, through these times. Um, I've been considering maybe, uh, streaming a bit more often to help, you know, uh, provide a little bit more, uh, entertainment for people who are, you know, stuck inside. Um, let me know in the comments if you'd like me to stream more often, uh, and if you'd watch. Um, but yeah, thanks for hanging out and, uh, I'll see you next time. Take care.